Okay, so maybe let me start the recording. Um, okay, so maybe we can get started with uh, some just a uh, uh, first uh, a brief reminder of the logistics. Uh, so hi everyone, welcome to another um, uh, snap talk, and uh, uh, just a, a quick reminder of the logistics. So please mute yourselves during the talk. Uh, but you are welcome and encouraged to leave your videos on so we can see more faces here. And the, the, the talk will be recorded and it is also being streamed on YouTube. So if you don't want your video to appear uh, in the recorded video, you can either mute yourself or you can go to the uh, YouTube link and watch the talk there. Um, so we will, if you have uh, uh, quick questions during the talk, you can uh, type that into the chat box and uh, I'm going to relay that questions, uh, those questions to the speaker. And if you have uh, uh, longer questions, you can wait until uh, the question breaks in, in between or like wait until the end. We have a, a Q and A session at the end. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so today we are uh, really glad to have uh, Professor Nigar Kelvash speak here. Uh, so Nigar is the chair of business analytics at EPFL uh, at the College of Management of Technology. Um, prior to uh, joining EPFL, she was a faculty member at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and at Georgia Tech. So her research interests are broadly in the area of statistical learning and applied probability with a special focus on network inference and the caus causality. She is a recipient of the NSF Career and uh, AFOSR YIP Awards. And today she will be talking to us about uh, database alignment, um, fundamental limits and the efficient algorithms. Uh, so let's welcome Nigar and uh, uh, Nigar, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Raina. It's lovely to, of course, talk to um, to talk to you all, and especially see so many familiar faces. Thank you for joining this talk. Um, so, as Raina mentioned, so I want to talk today about database alignment, and specifically. So, this would be the outline of the talk. It's a little bit the outline is ambitious, so I don't know to how much of it I'm gonna get. So, I would try to motivate the problem and discuss it with you, and uh, also. Uh, perhaps put it in a little bit of perspective, how does it relate to some of the other problems that are getting a lot of attention these days and mention our results. If time allows me, I would like to at least tell you a little bit about what is the gist of some of the analysis we, we carry on. Um, so we all are aware that uh, basically data collection is everywhere. Uh, all these apps that we are using and various sharing economy and other types of um, uh, apps that are available to us and services end up actually also acquiring lots of data from the users that are using them. So this uh, diverse data allows us to possibly pull data together and then get greater benefit than if you don't have all these various resources available. The problem is that um, sometimes this data junction might not be feasible in part because the data is uh, protected through anonymization and so on. Uh, but of course, um, data has structure, namely across these various um, mediums and um, databases, you might have correlations that allows you to actually do things that even if the data is anonymized, you know, uh, you would have thought it's not feasible, but it becomes actually feasible. I would talk about a specific setting of this basically uh, data junction across various sources, and this is the so-called data alignment, and it allows us in certain settings to pull data together. So on the flip side, uh, the same, uh, you know, everything good always have some caveat too. So the caveat is that, you know, it could uh, actually end up creating risks on the user privacy. And it's not um, rare to see these type of headlines that uh, basically tell us that something has gone wrong and there has been breaches for uh, various databases and, you know, uh, privacy. And in fact, in later parts of the talk, I will talk specifically about this Netflix example in more detail. 
So what is crucial is for us to understand that, you know, how can we like, you know, characterize this trade off between the user, uh, the usefulness of the data in terms of uh, richness of its features, possibly lack of noise and so on. But also while we are pulling data together, how can we also characterize possibly what is on the flip side risk on the privacy and so on. And it, this basically manifests itself in things like, you know, obfuscating features, introducing say artificial noise noise and then possibly even limiting the type of data we can actually capture. So this is the big grand scheme of um, things in some sense and why we care about these problems. But what is the specific problem mathematically that I want to talk about? So I want to talk about this um, alignment problem and let's see what is alignment. So here we are in a setting that we have two data structures, right? So in these two data structures, we have so-called users. So colors are indicating users in this graphics. Uh, to, I just want to make sure everyone at least uh, captures the the framework. So uh, these users could possibly have data only in one of the databases or in multiple of them. For instance, the green and the blue user have data in both, while the red and the brown and yellow only in one of the databases they end up appearing, right? So the point is that, you know, we like to, for privacy of users, obfuscate their IDs. However, the data is correlated when it pertains to a certain user. So even if you try to obfuscate it, the correlation in the data could say something about what are the possible users, right? So you might be able to somehow use, pull this information from the correlation and decide that, you know, who were the, which, uh, which data uh, in the two sets pertain to the same user ID and so on. So in fact, more formally, the way this is done is that you can think about it, you have a database and this database uh, can have information associated with the user. Sometimes the information that is associated could be just some, some sort of uh, features uh, of this form. This is what we call a database, like say, like it's medical records of a user. Sometimes it might actually um, encode some type of interaction between the users and objects in this setting. So each ID is also connected to certain objects, right? Let's say you're rating movies in a database, right? So that would be another case. And even you might have another case which arises that your data has this graphical uh, structure where users also can have interaction amongst themselves, right? Think about, for instance, uh, connections between the friends and so on on a social media. So I want to give one example of seeing that this is not an imaginary problem. Actually, it, 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 uh, it happens in real life. So we have this so-called bipartite alignment when people do movie ratings. So what does happen here? So um, uh, there was this case where Netflix had, um, Netflix price has a challenge data set and the data set was of this form. So you had user IDs and so-called movie IDs and users were rating certain movies, right? So you were giving ratings to it. Similarly, there is another database, which is IMDb. And if some of you guys like watching movies, you might have already seen the, um, this uh, IMDb information. In IMDb, also, you have so-called user IDs. Again, you have movie names, and then you have movie ratings. And unlike the Netflix uh, situation, often in IMDb, users have to register with their full names. So you actually know who is rating what movie. So then such users, not surprisingly, might avoid publicly rating certain movies of their interest, right? Because they can actually shed information that you don't want necessarily people to know. You know, the movies you watch or rate might tell something about your political views, religious beliefs, sexual orientation, and so on, right? So the issue is this, though. Even though you have two separate data sets, IMDb, and you have the anonymized Netflix challenge. What was shown in uh, a landmark paper in actually 2006 is that you can indeed use the ratings of the users, even though there's not an exact match, they're not rating the exact same movies. Still, you can actually use it and then you know uh, try to pull in these user IDs uh, across IMDb and Netflix Prize, which allows you to then learn who were the people that were supposedly anonymized in this Netflix challenge. And actually it ended up forcing Netflix to even you know, uh, end this because you know, they, they had to cancel the sequel to their original comp uh, you know, competition because there were lawsuits that was threatening them. So in this database problem that I'm interested in, 
the issue is again very similar, right? So in each database, I have set of users and then I have set of features that are associated with each user. So here these dots are my users and the lines I have here, these black kind of lines are the features that in general are vectors associated with a user, right? So I could have more than one data set and in this talk, I'll just limit myself to two of them. So there's two databases, I call them A and B. And my um, observation is that some of the users are shared across these, the colors are denoting these users that are shared. And this is the features of my problem, the assumptions I'm gonna make. First of all, I'm gonna assume that users pertaining, um, the features pertaining to each user in a certain database are independent, but identically distributed. So let's say you're looking at database B all the features here are independent across the users and they have the same basically distribution. But across databases, data of the same user is jointly distributed. Furthermore, this basically joint of the data across these two databases that pertains to a user is going to again be independent of any other pair, right? So the blue pairs information, the joint, that joint is independent of the joint of the uh, red information pertaining to the user red, right? And they're also identically distributed. So, and again, of course, we have more generally that, you know, features of every user are independent of any other user's features, right? So that would be basically the, the assumption we have for our database. Any questions so far about the model? So I have a quick question, Nigar. So are the two databases have the same, uh, do they have the same set of users? Not necessarily. So very good question. So they don't need to be necessarily of the same size. So then like, uh, for example, if the database B has this one additional user, then that user just draws its features from some distribution, right? So there's no joint distribution between. Exactly, them. exactly. So I'm gonna more precisely mathematically show how this is exactly done, but yes. So there is a marginals for each data set and you only when you introduce a matching between the users, then you have this basically joint for them. Very good question. Thank so you. more formally, what exactly Vena was asking is this. So I can have two data sets. They're not necessarily of the same size, right? And then in this data set, I have a set of identifiers for my users. I'm going to uh, use these letters, uh, the Cal U and Cal V to, to, uh, to denote what are the set of identifiers. And then there is the mapping between the identifiers. So this mapping M, of course, doesn't necessarily cover all the users because it's not of the same size, right? So it's matching the blue users, the red ones, but as you see, the other guys are not connected, right? So what happens is this, given some specific mapping, which is these pairs of users, what happens is this. So I would uh, use this notation W of N. So this is the pairs of users that are mapped by this matching M. The UM are mapped users from the database A. VM are those that are coming from actually database B. So here in this case, as you see the, the brown, green, and the light blue are not in this part of this matching, hence they are not included in any of these sets, right? So uh, under this basically matching. So then I can talk about a likelihood. So uh, I'm considering this arbitrary features from some data set A and, you know, just, for ease of presentation, I keep calling it feature, but this is really a vector feature, right? So it's a vector of features. It doesn't have to be scalar. So I have this X, which pertains to um, uh, this basically features that corresponds to the, um, to the entries of database A, and you would use Y for the database B. And this is the structure I was trying to um, convey. So you can have certain marginals on a distribution of each of the features for each database. For instance, for database A, I have F of X for the marginal, F of Y denotes the marginal of the features in database B. Whenever there is a pair which is joined through this matching, then I have this other function F of X, Y, which denotes the joint of these basically users. So in all this talk, I'm gonna assume that I know these distributions. So basically the marginals and the joints are known. And this is the structure of the interdependence in my data set. Is it clear folks? Thank you.
So then if I have such a setting, not surprisingly, you know, we can all write the likelihood function, right? So the likelihood function of such a database would be of this form. So this is, of course, you know, you have to give an, a matching M write this, right? For a matching M, recall our notation that I was using W for the pairs that were included in the matching. So for these guys, my likelihood is the joint FXY. For the ones that are basically in data set A, but are not, you know, part of the matching, then you would uh, have the basically the second term. Do you guys see my highlighting on the slides? I think it's working finally. Yes, I can see it. So, <laughs> and then for the ones that are in V and not included in the matching, again, similarly, of course, the likelihood just be the marginal, right? So this is what we expect to see in terms of our likelihood. Then what I'm gonna just do is that I'm gonna change these limits of the sum. So I'm gonna include also these users to make my you know, notation more favorable. And then of course, you know, so because the, if you add these, then you have to remove them. And the way I remove them, I'm just gonna bring them to the denominator of the first term that I had. So why am I doing it? I'm doing it so that, you know, you see that actually in this change, little change of notation, then the two second terms do not depend on the matching anymore, right? So they, they become like, you know, independent of the matching. So then, you know, when we need to talk about say maximizing the likelihood to estimate this correspondence between the data sets, right? Which is what my goal is in this problem, right? So I have discussed, I have this basically two data set and my goal is that, you know, this was how they're generated. So this would be the likelihood, the joint likelihood of these data sets. I would try to find this matching M, right? And uh, what you know is that you can calculate all these likelihood functions because the distributions are known, but what you don't know is the matching M. So you're not given that matching M, right? So my goal is to like find this. And one way of course to do it would be then maximizing of course this likelihood, right? So before I go there, I wanna just tell a little bit about a notation that I'll be using in this talk. And you're gonna see that it becomes very helpful because then you can use the same, uh, same kind of mathematical approach then to model a lot of related problems. So recall that I had this uh, likelihood function, which I just described for you after I dropped the two terms that don't depend on M. I can define a matrix G, which is real valued and its cardinality is uh, U cross V where remember U was the size of the user set in basically the first data set and then V was in the second data set, right? And then I can, for the entries of this matrix, I can just stick in this so-called information densities, right? So the information densities, as you can see, are of course related to the form of my likelihood, right? So that is all I'm sticking in there for each pairs of users U and V. Then, I can define this so-called matrix that encodes my matching. What is this doing? So for each UV, whenever the entry of this matrix M is one, then it means that I have matched users U and V. And I put zero if I have not matched those users, right? So this would be the notion of uh, the matching that I have. So then it's not surprising that, you know, uh, that if I have this notation, of course, it's obvious that, you know, then the maximum likelihood estimation that I'm after, this quantity would be maximizing this inner product between these matrices, right, G and M, that's what I'm after, right? So then I can basically um, have this uh, formulation of the problem and then M in general is a partial permutation matrix. And the reason it's partial is of course, because the sizes are not the same, right? So it's not, that is the, the reason. So if this M was known, right? Uh, its size was known, then uh, maximizing this inner product, right? Uh, is equivalent to this so-called um, linear assignment problem, uh, unbalanced linear assignment problem because the sizes are not the same. And it is. it was shown in uh, 2012 that I I in fact, there exists a polynomial time algorithm for this. And this is the, uh, it's basically the complexity of the algorithm and it actually uses the Hungarian algorithm to do this. So this basically um, would be the uh, would be the problem that we are after to doing so therefore i mean practically it means this maximum likelihood estimation is something you can do in polynomial time right that is what it means however recall that you know this mle is supposed to optimize overall mappings right so it's even so it's still it's too costly if you know uh, 
you know, even if you were not interested in finding the complete mapping, right? So in general, this is not something which is um, low complexity. So you might be also interested in possible other type of queries, right? So one of them would be this so-called maximum row alignment. So what you do in a maximum row alignment, so you're given a user in one of the databases, let's say A, and you want to find the feature in database B that has the property that basically this feature in B maximizes the likelihood, right? And you're gonna ignore all the other features in the data set A. So of course, this is the same, uh, as you can imagine, it's equivalent to picking the maximum entry in row of this G uh, that I had, which was this basically um, information densities, right? You could also think about even something more simple, which would be thresholding. So you can decide if a given feature pair is correlated enough for you to declare them you know, um, as a pair. And then of course this would perform a likelihood ratio test with the same, you know, with some threshold that you desire acceptable, right? So in, in some sense it's equivalent to accepting, you know, correspondence in entries of G as long as they are, you know, they're above a certain threshold, then you say that that U and B are in a matching. Not surprisingly, you can actually explain all of this in, as a LP, right? So the LP for the maximum likelihood is of this form. So you're maximizing this inner product. And here I wanna make sure that I have like, you know, this matching, right? So basically this, uh, you know, so this, the fact that this is, of course the M's are non-negative. And then you wanna make sure that, you know, you're always picking a single V, right? Hence, you know, you would have this format which guarantees that this would be a partial matching, right? And um, in this setting, just that you, you see that why this is equality, the other one is inequality, because I assumed here that the cardinality of U is less than B, right? So I assume the first database is smaller than the second one. So the maximum row is in a sense the same LP, except that I am relaxing this uh, other constraint, right? Because I was only doing this per row and I was not you know, guaranteeing that stays a matching, uh, partial matching for the whole matrix. Similarly, for the threshold one, you just need to make a little observation is that if I, in fact, were to remove some value, a threshold tau that is desirable to me from this G, it actually doesn't change anything in my program because I have these constraints, these blue constraints that, you know, doesn't change basically um, the program. So then what I have in this G minus tau, all I need to do is then I need to solve this other problem that in a sense is a relaxation of the maximum row one, right? So you can see that they're in a sense nested, like one is relaxing the other one. Any questions on these formulations of the LPs or the, in general, the problems? Okay, great. So then we have this, let's see what kind of results we end up getting. So we, when we look at this problem and we want to understand that, you know, um, basically what feature of this database and, you know, um, uh, the properties of the database would make it um, allow us to align the, um, uh, the, the users and learn the matching, it's not even clear what would be, uh, you know, the information theoretic quantity that one needs to even, uh, even look at, right? So, but because we can actually formulate the problem, look at these different, uh, basically, um, schemes to decide the matching, then, you know, we can analyze it and see what actually pops out of there. So what we find is this, let's assume that, uh, you know, your, um, your databases, the entries are coming from some finite alphabet, right? So these features X and Y that I had, right? So these are from a finite alphabet. And what we end up seeing that we get this information theoretic measure, which in a second time, I'm gonna to explain to you what it is. It's this circular basically value of information that comes up and this is the feature that in some sense, we're gonna learn now a threshold on it. So it's the type of information theoretic measure, which is gonna tell us that if it's less or more than a certain threshold, is it feasible to do matching? Otherwise it's not feasible to do matching. And in what sense it is feasible to do matching or not, right? So just to make life easier, I'm gonna describe the results when the databases are of the same size. So then I have this value N, which is the size of my databases. And then I'm assuming also that, you know, this size of the database N is going to infinity. 
So what we end up having is this so-called achievability scheme. So what is the achievability saying? It says that if value of this information theoretic measure is larger than two log n, where n was the size of my database, then maximum likelihood finds the correct mapping uh, almost surely, right? It's uh, with basically, um, sorry, with high probability with one minus O of one, right? So the probability of making an error is going to zero basically, right? So you, you do the right thing. You can find the matching if you have enough of this uh, basically correlation metric that is uh, here present this I. We also have a matching converse where the matching converse says that if actually this value of this measure is less than this two log n, then any algorithm is gonna find the correct uh, probable, uh, correct mapping with probability that is going to zero, right? So basically you, you, you have this converse that matches the achievability. So what is this value I that I'm talking about? So to see this is that when the size of the databases are the same, then the smallest possible error you can do is should have at least size two, right? Because if you are uh, mapping a user to a wrong one, then the same holds for that second user. So you should at least make always the mistake between pairs of users, right? So let's call the correct mapping little m, the wrong one m prime. So here m is matching u1. Let's say u1 was supposed to uh, be mapped to v1 in the second, um, uh, second database and uh, you know, some U2 to V2, and then M2 is flipping them, right? So messing up the matching for these guys. So because you ended up picking, you're making an error, means you picked up the wrong matching, means that you know it was more likely, right? So basically this value that we had for ML, that the inner product for M prime should have been larger than if you were using this M. And the way we define this, remember that this M was just this one zero uh, matrix, right? So this would exactly correspond to this, uh, uh, values of your G matrix. You are you taking these uh, entries and then you know you're saying that this has to be larger than zero. And because recall that the way I, I described how G was and how my F was and so on, then if you are trying to, um, um, so I, I'm, I'm after uh, basically characterizing this error, which you know, I can just use a churn of bound and is of this form and recall what we had earlier. If I just use the, uh, definition of my G and how these things were distributed um, uh, for my databases, I would find that basically this expectation would correspond to this setting, right? So this is exactly the values that we had for our um, information densities and the, inf um, and the value of our distribution. So the expectation, of course, you, you're taking expectations, you need to sum up over all these basically entries, right? So this would be what pops out here. So now look at what we have. So I'm claiming that this error is bounded by this value and I can write this value as a trace of this matrix where this matrix has cardinality X, Y, which is basically the size of these alphabets that I had, right? For my, uh, uh, for my um, uh, two databases, right? And then what, what you end up having is that, you know, if I define a matrix Z that the entry X, Y is this square root of X, uh, this F of the joint F of X and Y, then this quantity, this trace is gonna correspond to my correlation. And this is what matters, right? So the error is gonna be function of this. I'm just gonna call the minus log of this, this I, and that is where this basically result is coming from. So this is the metric that pops up naturally, this basically measure or you know, distance that pops up. And then we just call this circular information, right? That is what we end up seeing here. Any questions about this part? So another interesting case would be that we might wanna consider a setting that we are not coming from a finite alphabet, Namely, let's say your databases are Gaussian, right? So then the features in this A and B are each like some uh, basically um, vector. And then uh, when the users are, um, when you use the same user, recall that they were correlated across the databases. And this correlation is in form of a multivariate Gaussian specifically. And here, this critical basically measure of information that is 
characterizing the correlation in some sense uh, of a user along the databases ends up being something familiar is in fact the mutual information between these correlated features and we again end up having achievability and a converse and it's of this form that basically um, is tight in a sense that you know if this mutual information is larger than two log n then uh, you would do well then the um, finding the mapping um, is correct with probability one minus little o of one and if you're below this threshold then you know any basically algorithm is gonna make a mistake right so you so you you have vanishing probability of learning the um, the right mapping so these results in fact are considering that you know what the my notion of when you're succeeding as an algorithm is when you can successfully give the exact mapping. So what if we did not want to learn the exact mapping, but it was okay for us to learn good enough of a mapping where by good enough of a mapping, I mean that the ratio of the errors are vanishingly small, right? So in this setting, then we can also have some um, uh, similar uh, results. And here the value uh, that is your threshold reduces. So if you look at the results for the almost exact alignment versus the exact alignment, the threshold is a factor of two different. So in one of them, it's um, basically two log n, in the other one is log n, right? So this would be basically the results that we end up getting in this setting. So, I think it might be a little bit nicer to see them pictorially. So I'm gonna just show them to you, like what does it mean uh, in terms of like, what do these results mean in terms of like error exponent and so far, but before I, so on, but before I go to that, any questions like clarifications for what has happened so far, or is it clear? So Negar, all the results yes. that you present are assuming uh, that both the databases have the same set of, same set of users or just same number of entries? So they Since assume the that you basically have the same size, right? And the set of size of these users are the same, right? So you want to basically find the same ones. It actually doesn't have to be this way. It's just, you know, specifying the results become a bit nastier. So if I have, so there's two parts that get nastier when you're trying to analyze it. First of all, the type of error event when they're not of the same size changes. So I need to consider certain errors that are cycles when they're of the same size. When they're not equal, then you need to consider also path. So, you know, so it's just the analysis becomes a little bit more cumbersome, but it's not, I just thought for a talk, it's easier to just stick to the one that they're all the same. But yeah, excellent questions as always, Siva. <laughs> so any other questions? Nika, I think there, there was a, a quick question in the chat. Uh, Su Xiu is asking, are you missing expectations inside the square roots? So Su Xiu, maybe you can clarify which square roots are those? Yeah, I think I just got confused. Yeah, you're right. Uh, how did you get from the last step to this step? Okay, so the, to remember that, is this what you mean? Uh, basically these, these lines? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. You just uh, expanded the expectation. So, yeah, Is that so it? I just use the form of my distribution. You see how the distribution looks like. So then you're going to have cancellation of the denominator, right? With, uh, with the, with basically, so uh, with the numerator there of the, uh, basically when you write the terms, you just, you know, you need the expectation, right? So I need to find, put the probability value there. So these guys are going to cancel out and then you're going to basically have this extra square root that stays okay. here. With one of them can with this and because it's the expectation I'm taking the summation that's um, okay okay that makes yeah yeah very Thanks. good question excellent so then just to, maybe it would help us a little bit to see what does this mean pictorially like I like to look at these things in a graph usually so I'm gonna sh have two axes here so one of them is telling so ideally of course you want to have the exact functions right so in the ideal world, you want to see as in terms of this, you know, what are these achievable kind of, you know, um, graphs that you would end is that for each value of the, um, of the mutual information, what would be the error exponent that you're attaining, right? But we don't have this, we, we instead just have the regions, right? But we don't have the exact curve necessarily, right? So let me explain this better. So for instance, if I have this, um, 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 uh, the x um, the x basically 
coordinate here is um, I'm going to use this mutual information, but to make life easier, I'm going to divide it by this log of n. So this is basically the value here, right? So I'm plotting the x, which is i x y divided by this log n. On the y axis, I'm interested in, so my y is the error exponent. So basically here, my expectation and number of the errors I'm, uh, I'm, um, I'm creating is n to the y. So the y axis would be just this error exponent, right? So this is what I would be plotting. So let's see what does this converse say? So the converse in case of this uh, basically um, exact alignment that we had, you remember this value to log n that I had, this, what this um, translate to, it says that if my x here, this value of x, right, which is basically the limitation on, uh, on the mutual information, is this x is less than two, it means that my y has to be, my error exponent has to be larger than zero. So this is something that basically you can't achieve, right? So your number of the errors are gonna be of this big omega one. If you are in the other case, right? So the one that you have lower correlation. So here I have this log n instead of two log n. So it basically corresponds to the case that, you know, I'm looking at basically my value of x being uh, less than one. Oh, I can, my apologies here. This should be, a, this was less than two and this should be a less than one, not larger than one. It's a typo on this slide. Then it means that, you, you know, then what you get here is y has to be larger than one, right? So you get basically this red region that is, depicted here. What is the achievability for the MLE saying in the high correlation? So if you're just again using the same thing, like, you know, working with the values we had, we get this green region here. So anything above this uh, green line here, this um, line of Y is less than two minus X, you, you basically everything here is uh, things that you can achieve. Furthermore, we did some uh, more analysis in a more recent work. And in the low correlation, you also can learn this part, which is a quarter circle, right? So this one also tells you again about what happens when your X is larger than one, right? And then this is also this green region also becomes feasible. So this is what we know for the MLE. But if I was using that max row alignment, which I was describing to you, which is not necessarily using, um, using the entire matchings information, it's just doing it per row, then what would be achievable to us would be what is above this, um, this basically um, uh, 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 graph that I'm showing here. So I wanna make sure I don't call it a line because it's a line for a certain ch uh, chunk of it when X is larger than two in high correlation. But when you're in the low correlation, then you know it's actually a curve, right? So you get this in general, this form of the max row. And the analysis for the achievability, the thresholding would basically give you the other cyan line, right? So it would be above this uh, formulation is what is um, depicted. So this is what is the regions that are achievable to us, right? So uh, what we can actually learn. Is it clear then this is basically the meaning of what I was uh, plotting to you, uh, what I was writing to you earlier. I think it might be easier to see what it means in terms of the basically exponents. Nega, I have a question. Yes. I'm a little yes. confused about the green regions because I thought you had tight achievability on converse. I mm -hmm. thought in both your theorems, the green should be just opposite of red. So why do you have the triangle in the bottom and the curve in the top? Yeah, so basically that, that's a very good question, right? So what you, uh, you end up having is that if you look at it, they're not exactly the same, right? So, so if you look at it, you have this uh, omegas, little omegas and the big omegas, right? So they're not exactly the same, right? Uh, and you don't have the exact form. So what I know, and I mean, it could be, it's just what we can analyze. So I don't know what is necessarily the, you know, I just know that the, the basically correcting this lies the right curve in this white part, right? But I don't know what is the shape of it exactly. I see, I see. Yeah, very good question. Got it, thanks. Yeah, so then what I want to talk about is that, okay, so this is the results we get here. And I hope I can briefly tell you how the analysis is done. I mean, I gave a little bit of the flavor of it when I was discussing what was the, um, the, the uh, with the churn of bound. But I want to say that, you know, this is actually related to quite another slew of problems that are getting a lot of attention these days. Namely, we had a very nice talk last week uh, in the same seminar series, which was on this so-called planted matching, right? So these uh, problems are very, uh, related. 
And um, I'll in a second show you that uh, why are these related. And you know, to understand the relationship of these problems is non-trivial. So even though our result existed since 2018, I have noticed that it's not even referred in the in the work uh, that it appeared here in 2021. And I don't think it's uh, to not give credit or anything. I just think it's not clear necessarily. You know, it's complex the relationship. So one might not even see that these are actually related the problem. So I want to explain this relationship because I think it's cool. So in the planted matching problem, so you know, before I explain the planted matching problem, I just want to one second remind you what was it that we were doing in ours, right? So in the problem I was talking about, I, I can describe basically this matching that I'm using as a type of uh, uh, basically um, uh, this uh, learning the uh, max weighted, you know, matching in a bipartite graph. Why? Because I had this G matrix that I described for you. And then these blue stuff would be the ones that are corresponding to the true matching, right? And of course, I can have some error events, right? Which is what you are learning when you, you're calculating the value of, uh, of that um, basically information density that I had in my matrix, right? The G, and these are the red ones. So these are the wrong basically edges you're learning. So then G that I have in my setting, this matrix G that I had, you can of course depict it as such in terms of a weighted bipartite graph, right? And the MLE here is, as I told you, it's actually equivalent to find this linear assignment problem, right? That finds the max weight matching. So this is comparable to the planted matching, which was studied um, in this papers, uh, six that uh, you, you saw the presentation also last week in certain setting. And I wanna describe that. So before I do that, so remember we had this formulation of our problem. Now let's remember what was the planted matching. So in the planted matching problem is of this form, right? So you basically have some random weighted bipartite graph which corresponds to some underlying matching M. So these blue things again are denoting the matching in this problem. Um, and then for all the things that are not a matching, unlike our problem, you might not have necessarily a complete graph. So you might have some edges there or not edges there, right? So for the things that are not part of the matching, then with some probability D over N, where N is the size of this graph and D is the average degree, you were picking, you pick an edge, right? And then we also have this property that everything here is independent, right? So basically the weights of the edges, existence of the edges, everything is independent. And the way you assign weights in this problem is according to two distributions, right? So for all the edges that are part of the matching, you use the IID weights from some distribution, let's call that P. And then for the ones that are not part of the matching, but they ended up appearing, you IID were picking up some other edges with some distribution Q. So specifically in, in this reference six, Q has a, a specific form, right? And I want to draw your attention that it has this specific form because it's gonna become important in a little bit that I'm gonna discuss that. So again here, you know, we started from a matrix G and then I was telling you that there's a corresponding graph right here. You start from a graph, clearly there's also a corresponding matrix that you can write, right? This G that again, you're calculating here. What is interesting here is that you might not have all the entries because some edges might not be present there, right? And the values that you're doing are again gonna, you know, depend on what you are picking up from this distribution. So the goal of this planted matching is actually, you know, you want to identify this M, right? You know, the, learn the matching given that uh, you, you have two uh, edges that come from two different type of distribution. And the result there says that, in fact, you again have this converse and achievability type of things, which here, like the metric is gonna be the Bhattacharya distance between these distributions P and Q. And if they're less than a certain amount, you know, uh, or more than that, so if the correlation is large enough, then you do well. If it's like less than, you know, you don't um, end up basically do well, right? So, so you wanna have enough, um, differences of this uh, two basically distribution. So in our problem though, remember that I had this uh, matrix G and then uh, my goal was uh, learning the matching here in this complete graph, right? Where my scores were uh, always this so-called information densities, right? So the thing to pay attention is that in this problem, unlike the setting of the planted matching, I don't have independence. 
So uh, namely what is happening is that I, I'm so sorry, I just have an alarm going off. I'll just turn it off and I'll be back. So sorry. My apologies, this is the time I take my kid to his class. So I, I just had an alarm for it. I forgot to disable it. Anyways, so in our problem, recall that I had this matching. And for this matching that I have, these values in the matrix that are in blue, they're independent. Because these were the ones that were correlated across the databases. And I told you all of these were across users independent. But everything else is correlated actually. So what you end up having is that unlike the problem with the planted matching, all the red entries are gonna have certain correlations, right? Because for instance, when you are looking at what is happening um, between these entries, you would end up having that, basically this is what's on the bottom of the slide. So all the values, let's say in some row, you are clearly function of this A of U. So they're correlated. Same thing exactly happens for the, for the columns. So in a sense, the database alignment problem is in a sense related to planted matching, but the structure of your matrix is nastier. So you have all these correlations instead of having independent entries that are just picked from two separate distributions. So I think this is an important uh, point to, to make sure that we see it, right? So, there's a special case of this database, uh, database alignment that actually ends up giving you independence. When? So if you have, let's say Gaussian databases and your number of the dimensions is going to infinity, but the correlation, this mutual information between any finite subsets of the feature is small, right? So it's O of one. Then we can asymptotically show that actually this G has independent entries and then the independence entries of, of this form, right? So the values corresponding to true pairs, these are the blue things in the matrix. They're gonna come from a normal, which is distributed with these parameters, while the values that are for the false pairs have a different mean. So one of them is I of the mutual information, the other one is the negative mutual information. So then when one sees that might feel tempted that, okay, so then I can use this threshold that I told you in six and decide what happens here. But the, you recall that I told you they have a special cue in that. That was why I was drawing your attention. So in fact, the requirements on uh, that were required for the theorem in six are not satisfied by this cue. Nonetheless, for curiosity, we plugged it in, in the Bhattacharya bound there and very interestingly enough, you end up actually recovering the exact same threshold, which is uh, if you know this mutual information is large, even though you're not satisfying the condition of the theorem. So that is curious. So one wonders if the basically, maybe it's not necessarily for the Q to have this limitation and you know the results actually apply to a wider class of the Qs. So it's, uh, I just thought it's cool to see this uh, relationship between the two problems. Any questions on this? Is it clear? Excellent. So another problem that um, some of you might have uh, encountered is this notion of this problem of so-called graph alignment. So in the graph alignment, the problem is um, different. So what, but you know, again, you, you, you would see that, you know, there's some relation to this um, database matching. So in fact, I personally started first looking at the graph alignment problem and then I drifted to the database alignment. So in the graph matching problem, you have two sets of graphs and you want to learn the correspondence between the vertices. So if the graphs are exactly the same, this is actually a very old problem, it's this so-called graph isomorphism problem. If the graphs, however, don't have the exact same edge set, but there is some correlation uh, in terms of if an edge is present across these uh, graphs. So if you're looking at correlated graphs instead of the same copies of the same graph, then this is the problem we are interested in. It's like so-called noisy, um, you know, uh, match the, the case of the noisy uh, setting, right? So here, basically um, what we have is that the edges are correlated, of course, if 
both endpoints are mapped correctly, right? So you can think about that the vertex alignment can correspond to something in why, when you lift it to, to the edges, right? So you're talking about like, you know, aligning the edges correctly, right? And here it's assumed that all the edge pairs in the problems that I have looked at, or you assume that all the edges are actually IID. So if that is the case here, then what is nice is that, you know, you can still talk about all these uh, sets of uh, size, all the subsets of size two of the vertices, which correspond to possible edges, right? And then you can have some proxy for the log likelihood of the graphs. And I don't want to go too much to the details of it because it's very messy, the formulation. So you can actually drive it here that, you know, there is also a likelihood that pops up in this setting. And this likelihood is going to end up having this structure that I have again some matrix G where my matrix G now is of this cardinality, right? So I need to look at this tensor products, right? Where U and V were basically the size of uh, the vertex sets, right? So you're looking at this object. And now what you have is that your matching is gonna be a vector, which is encoding this zeros and one. And if U and V are the same vertex or the correct alignment, you're gonna have one in that, uh, in that basically. Um, position, otherwise you have a zero. So basically this is gonna end up being the form of your likelihood. So why is this interesting? Because again, you can write your MLE as a type of, uh, optim of uh, again, an optimization problem, but as you see, this is not anymore a LP, right? So this is basically the form that you would end up having here. And because you wanna have like, you know, perfect, uh, of course, um, you wanna have a proper matching, these things have to be one. And of course, M's have to be of this value. We can also show that under certain condition, you know, you don't need to worry about this one and make the problem easier. And the way you make it easier is that you look at the convex relaxation of it, right? So you can actually do a convex relaxation. And then how is this then related to the problem I was discussing? I hope that it's, you, you can see that, you know, they're, they're similar in a sense that, you know, you have this G and the M here. So in the database alignment, you are solving this LP while you have the quadratic program that you're solving in case of the graph matching. And what is interesting is that, as I told you, like in the first case, you have this polynomial Hungarian algorithm, right? And for the second problem, it's actually not clear. So we have results about the information theoretic result, uh, threshold, but people don't know what is actually in what regions you, you have possibly polynomial time algorithms or how does the complexity change? I mean, for some regions, uh, this is resolved, but not for the entire thing, right? And we might think that, okay, this is MP hard, but it's not, you know, it's MP complete problem, but this is not for any G, right? So your G has a special structure. So it's not clear actually what's going on exactly in this problem. Any questions on this? Because I think this is very interesting to see that, you know, there is this connection and I hope it, act, it makes some of you guys also possibly take a look at it and improve on what is known. Okay. If not, I want to just very quickly tell you about how the analysis is done. So to tell you a little bit about the analysis, remember what we were doing, right? So there is a true matching which is um, assigning basically the users across these databases. And I had this matrix M, which was, I had ones whenever you, you had the right matching. And just to make life easy, I'm gonna assume that for now, the true matching is such that, you know, it's on the diagonal, you have these guys, right? So basically the same indexes. And as I told you, they don't have to be the same size. So you can have extra vertices here. I call them V prime, right? These things that are not part of your matching in the second database. If we have an erroneous, matching, let's call it M prime. This M prime could be correct on some users. Like here, for instance, it does a good job with finding that U1 and V1 are the same, but as you see, it's messing up, right? And the messing ups can be either in terms of this cycle or you could have these paths, right? So they, they could have different structures that are happening, but anyways, it would correspond to some other matrix, which is this wrong one. If you look at the difference, then you observe something interesting. What is interesting is this, you get this basically blocks sub blocks in this M prime minus M. And whenever you had the correct matching, you get zeros. In the sub blocks that you have a mistake, you end up getting this plus and minus ones. 
And what is interesting is that if you actually did, let's, you know, just without loss of generality, let's say that you had, you ended up being in a, in a setting that you had two separate sub blocks of this form, something interesting happens, right? I can actually just decompose this to the case that I'm, I'm separating these sub blocks. And not surprisingly, if you were looking at actually that inner product that we were doing for our maximization, I can decompose it now to the parts that the error is coming from the top block and the error that is coming from the second block, right? So if then I am making a mistake that namely this M prime is doing better in my MLE uh, scoring than the true match, then it's because one of these parts basically was larger than zero, right? So this is where the error is coming from. And why is this nice? Because this allows me to actually do a, this, you know, this decomposition. So I can just, you know, um, limit myself to analyzing these so-called single components or the blocks, right? And, and, you know, that would suffice for me to understand what's going on. So again, if M is the true mapping and M prime is the false one, I want to draw your attention that every user is at most mapped by the correct mapping, right, once. And the same thing is true for M prime. So pictorial, if you remember it, that every node at most either one blue or one red arrow, one red edge was basically going, right? And this was just because I was doing this assignment, right? So all the then components that I end up having are of this form. This is what I was telling you earlier. So either all your errors are cycles or they are path, which is basically what we would end up having. For now, just one second, assume that my database sizes are the same in terms of users, then I can explain to you that it's of you or your errors are only of these cycles, right? This is what Siva as usually, you know, is ahead of what is presented. So it was asking earlier in the talk. So then it just suffices to analyze this cycle stuff, right? So specifically, let's for one second assume that I had cycle of lengths for cycle of lengths for arises when I'm exactly making a mistake between two users, right? So in this case, if I was writing the Chernoff bound, the Chernoff bound is exactly of this form that it's in terms of the finite alphabet, you would get basically this value uh, XP of this minus I circular. And in terms of the Gaussian, it depends on the mutual information, right? If instead you have some cycle of length to Delta, then you end up having some upper bound on your Chernoff bound, which are of this form, right? So these are the upper bounds that we can actually get. So basically, um, uh, to make life easy, I don't want to distinguish between them from now on. I'm just going to use I. Of course, it's going to depend in which case one of them is mutual information in the finite alphabet you're using this I circular, right? But it's kind of similar. So please note that when the size of my uh, basically user indexes are N, then the false mappings that can induce a cycle of lengths to delta are of, there's so many of them, right? So you would basically have this many of them. And I can just upper bound this value by n to the delta over delta. And why is this good? Because then it means that, you know, if my m, m hat is the ML estimator, then the expected number of the cycles that I have of length to delta that are basically contained in this difference of this matching is going to be now upper bounded by this value. So remember, this is what I was getting from my, so this, this is basically the, the number of such, such cycles, sorry, the first part in, to the delta over delta. And the, expo the exponential part is basically uh, what I was getting from my churn of bound, right? So I'm just putting these things together, right? And then rewriting it. So then I can actually, um, you know, the expected number of then my cycles are going to be um, like such. And then this result is coming from a simple use of a union bound. So all I'm doing is I'm doing a union bound right here. I'm not doing anything more clever. So, and of course this union bound is loose because a user cannot be part of multiple cycles, right? But I'm just adding them up. Nonetheless, it actually ends up working, right? So if I'm in this setting that my uh, value of the correlation is larger than this 2n, two two, uh, this 2 log n, this basically loose union bound type of arguments ends up working. And then, well, in the interest of time, let me be quick. So we can actually show that this is what we get. And then it, it so happens that, you know, the shortest error inducing cycle is of course gonna be this four one and it's gonna be basically dominating 
um, right? But even if you don't consider that, let's just say that you're summing. So this was just for the cycle of length to delta. In general, I should consider all possible patterns of error, right? So then I'm gonna consider all these things that, are, so you start from delta equal to because delta one is not an error, you're matching them correctly, right? So then you consider summing up on the total of these guys, right? And then you can actually, um, end up basically uh, finding this geometric series, and then you can uh, you can bound this geometric series, which is exactly the way we get our analysis, right? So you find that this i has to be larger than two log n, and then you know this would allow you this in this setting to have that your uh, expectation of your error is basically going to o of one. So the problem is that the same analysis does not work if i was going to a smaller correlation. If I go to a smaller correlation that in the lower correlation, what happens is this intersection between non-disjoint errors is gonna end up growing. Hence my union bound gets looser. So I need to do more clever stuff. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through this. And I think it at least gave a flavor of the analysis what the uh, basically that is available in our paper. So um, then, you know, we need to do a little bit more fancy work and then try to uh, find what happens in that setting. So thank you so much for listening. And I hope I'm on time and maybe I can take some more questions. How we can find your paper? Um, it's online. Uh, what is the title of it? Okay, so let me show you. Sorry, I think the slides are gonna be available. And you know, if we go back, okay. and when I discuss the results, I'm referring to them. There was a slide that was. Um, apology. So here you can, for instance, see like we discussed like where are the results coming from. So this would be one of the papers you can look at, for instance. Okay. And of course, you can also email me if you have questions. I'd be more than happy to, to point you out or even send you the paper. The Any slides other? are on our uh, SNAP website. You can download the slides there. Where, where, where we can download it? Uh, SNAP. Yes, yeah, SNAP website. Yeah. But it will be the slides will be available when? Today? It is already online. And oh. I'll paste a, a link again here. So I go to snap website. Yeah, and just um, sorry, the good thing about the slides that are available, it actually uh, it's a larger deck of slides, so you can see also the um, the explanation of what happens in the low correlation setting on the slides. Because I think sometimes it's yeah. easier to look through the slides than read the paper. Excellent, excellent. I got the slides. Yes, that's perfect. Good. Very good uh, presentation. Really. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very thorough. Thank you for also attaining. I think it's so tough to listen to talks on Zoom. So I really appreciate it. Thank for all of you. I, am, I, I am more interested in the security aspect of this alignment. Yeah, so. of course. It's very much related to uh, exactly the security problems. And in fact, mm. in my deck of slide, there is a short also discussion of saying how this is different than the, um, you know, so you cannot use um, things like uh, differential privacy to capture the same issue here. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, can this technique uh, that you described be used in differential privacy? So it's a very interesting question. So I was wondering if someone would ask this from me. So let me see if I can get quickly to the bottom of the slides. I don't know what's a quick way to go through them. So there is some relation to the differential privacy, right? So in a differential privacy, you have also two data sets. And often you have some algorithm that is answering a query, right? Uh, on a database that has the information pertaining to a specific user. And then another query, which corresponds to not having information of that user. And then you wanna make sure that you basically cannot distinguish them, hence keeping the, uh, the privacy of that user being included in the data set, right? So it depends what your algorithm is returning. If what your algorithm is returning is something like this user correspondences, 
So like some matching, then you can see that possibly one can see there's some relationship between these two problems as well. But overall, they're somewhat different. Very good. That answers my question. Yes, excellent question. Other questions? Because I had a quick question. This omega one term is that like log log n? Is that the order of the term? Um, I think so. Yes, I think it's log log n, but I don't exactly remember. I, I had a question about what happens between the two thresholds of uh, log n and two log n. So if you're in between, does the number of errors scale like some fractional power of n? Exactly. So this is what is in the... I was hoping this becomes clear in my graphs, the results. So, so recall that what I'm showing is the error exponent, right? So what we see is that we know what happens uh, for, for a basis. So this is basically what we end up having. So if I am, um, again, this is a, a mistake, sorry. If X is less than one, then I have that my exponent is of this form. And remember that you know, you're looking at basically N to the Y, right? So this is basically the setting you were getting. Here, you would uh, have these different achievability sets. So then when you are, so basically this is what you're asking, right? So this is this semicircle place. So when you are between one and two, then this is what you end up getting. So X is larger than one, then this is basically what you end up having. Okay, thanks. Yeah, excellent question. I think it's not uh, a semicircle part; it's a quarter circle. I would in, call it semicircle. I apologize. In uh, in in machine learning, one of the key steps is data set, uh, data collection, but also preparation. And many companies are working on data preparation. I think you what you described can be part of this important data preparation step. To so, yes. Filter out. Yeah, so, so I think this is very important to realize that one might think that you are you are releasing a data set and this data set, you know, in some sense is let's say a differentially private or has some nice property. But if you are releasing another data set, as I said, you know, this correlation could possibly make things go wrong, right? So let's say one of the data sets is obfuscated the idea of the users while the other one doesn't. And as long as there's enough correlation between them, it's a bit like that um, Netflix challenge, right? So you end up giving information away because of the correlations between the user set. Yeah, so I think it is a crucial step in data preparation, but many companies don't even know anything about it. Yeah, possibly, yeah. I, I, you know. I'm ashamed to say I'm not very familiar with what is done in practice for data protection, but yes, it's possible. Yeah, so data preparation is very important. You talk to companies who are doing data preparation, they don't understand this kind of alignment and how to uh, filter out any, any, any issues. They, they, they don't know. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, as I mentioned in the Netflix case, right, they even got lawsuits and they had to um, cancel the second part. Yes, you are correct. So if you are interested, I can introduce you or your work to some of the data, these data preparation companies. Perhaps you can educate them on your technology and how they can incorporate it and what they are doing. Yeah, thank you so much. I would be very happy if you pass, of course, the slides to them. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so Nika, I have one more uh, like a high level question. Uh, yes. So um, is there a way to see how the dimension of the features play, play a role in the, in the alignment, in the like the threshold? Uh, I yeah, know it's explicit in the mutual information, right? But uh, is there like a, any way to see it more explicitly? I think that's a very good question, right? So, so in, in a sense, like what the results show, at least for the type of analysis we are doing, it's really what matters is the mutual information, right? right. So it's not the size of the features, but what is happening mm -hmm. in terms of what is the value of these eyes. Right, yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
I see. Of course, then depending on, you know, then of course, you know, they, they're related, obviously, right? So then if you have lots of features, and I was saying, and even though the correlation was very small, right, you ended up going in this independent setting, which was very close to, say, the planted matching and so on. So there is an interplay between them, but the fundamental um, quantity that you care is the so-called mutual information. I do this because it depends if you're in the which setting, right? So the, yeah. Basically, that information to your quantity. And I want to say that what I like about these results, like, is that if you notice, it was a very good question, right? So, like, in the planted matching problem, what bothers me there is that the result is not information theoretic. So, it really depends on this P and Q, mm -hmm. right? While I, I kind of like that here, you just actually end up caring only about this mutual information, right? So, it's not on the specifics necessarily of the distribution. I see, okay. Is it possible to dis uh, discover uh, issues due to alignment if we use network coding? Instead of feeding the data, we feed coded data. So here, um, depends what you're doing, right? So, so, what, so these entries of my database are living in some space, right? For instance, they could be correlated Gaussians and so on. Let's say if you're using some sort of encryption. Or and, network coding, or network coding. I don't know if network coding is the right thing to do here, right? Because then okay. you need to take things across. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, okay. so I think it okay. might make more sense to talk about encrypting them. And if okay. the yeah, and I don't know how this encryption is done, but if still the encryption somehow keeps the correlations, then it would not help, right? So really exactly. Make sure. Yeah. Exactly. So your opinion, network coding is not the right way to exercise this technology. I don't think so, because I, I think that's a separate setting, right? So in network coding, you're actually sending this uh, basically messages over, right? Or coded is, data, you're right. But yeah, for encryption, exactly. and what you said, if the data is encrypted from two databases, if they are encrypted, uh, say again, please, what what is the problem if they are both encrypted? You know, so the, the result here is really saying that whether or not you can de-anonymize the information, right, in a sense of learning this, uh, um, you know, alignment between the um, entries depends on the correlation. So even if you were obfuscating the entry, right, so you were doing some sort of encryption, but your encryption is changing just the, let's say, you know, like, let's, in, we talk about the case I was talking about finite alphabet, right? So one way to think about encryption is that, let's say you use a substitution cipher, you're changing uh, some, uh, some, uh, some symbol to another one, right? So this is what a lot of these substitution ciphers do. This would not help here, right? Because you would just changing the mapping, but still the correlation would exist for a new set of symbols. Wow. Okay, so I think, sorry, I have to cut the discussion a, a little yeah. bit short. It's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah, offline, because we are uh, running over time. Uh, thank so, you. yeah, thank, uh, let's thank Nigara again for the great talk. And uh, I'll see you next week. Yeah, thank you so much, Nigar. Thank you so much for a wonderful seminar series, by the way. And it was great to see you all here. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye.